2 Chronicles 20, 35 through 37. Got your attention? We're here. We're all good. We're going forward. Word of God. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, joined with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted wickedly. He joined him in building ships to go to Tarshish, and they built the ships in Asian Geber. Then Eliezer, the son of Doduvahu, that's a good name to name a kid, Doduvahu, of Marashah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have joined with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. And the ships were wrecked and were not able to go to Tarshish. Now, I'll give you the context here and what we're looking at in a minute. But I want to tell you, first of all, who is Jehoshaphat and who is Ahaziah? Well, they're both kings and they're both kings of countries. Israel at one time was all one country under David and under Solomon and also Saul prior to them. Saul, David, and Solomon. However, when Solomon's son became king, his name was Rehoboam, um, ten of the tribes which, which uh, came to him uh, actually split from the tribes of um, Judah and Benjamin. And so then afterwards, from now on, you have two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The king of the northern kingdom of Israel is Ahaziah. The king of the southern kingdom of Judah is Jehoshaphat. In the southern kingdom, they had the temple. They had the place where God's ark was, where the presence of the Lord was. In the northern kingdom, they actually had created another system of worship that surrounded two golden calves. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But I want to show you what the Bible says about Ahaziah. Remember, Ahaziah is the king of the northern kingdom who had split from the southern kingdom. In, in 1 Kings 22, 51 through 53, it says, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned two years over Israel. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father had done. So, bottom line is the Bible says Ahaziah, not a good king, right? Why is he not a good king? Because he didn't serve God. Number two, Jehoshaphat. It says in the same chapter, verses 41 through 43, Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. He was 35 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Zilchi. He walked in all the way of Asa, his father. He did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. So what does the Bible say about Jehoshaphat? It says that Jehoshaphat did everything that was right in the sight of the Lord. So you have one king who is good, who does everything right in the sight of the Lord, and another king who is pronounced wicked or evil because he did not do what was right in the sight of God. Now, what's important to know about this is Jehoshaphat had been doing business with the northern kingdom for a couple of years. When Ahab, who was Ahaziah's father, was in charge, Jehoshaphat actually was offered by Ahab to go to war. You see, he had come together and we're having a family barbecue. You ever have a family barbecue? You know? And while they were having this family barbecue, Ahab, which is Ahaziah's father, said, Look, I got this problem with Syria. Will you go with me and help Syria? Because uh, help me defeat Syria. And uh, so Jehoshaphat kind of said, and the reason they were having this family barbecue, even though they were two different countries, is because Jehoshaphat and Ahab had actually made an alliance by marriage. Right? So, you know, I don't know if you've ever had two families that are kind of not getting along together, and all of a sudden two of the same people in the different families, two people in different families get married. You kind of have to get along. Even if you don't want to, you have to get along. That's the way they used to do business. They used to, even throughout Europe, during the ages of the kings, what they would do is the daughter of France would marry the king of England, and the king of England's daughter would marry the king of France. And the reason why they had multiple wives is because what happens is you unite Europe with family. You don't go to war with family. That was the principle behind it. Well, anyway, they're having a barbecue, and Ahab, who was not also good in the eyes of God, invites Jehoshaphat to go to war with him, and uh, Jehoshaphat decides that's a good idea, uh, but God doesn't think it's a good idea. 
In this war, Ahab was killed, and now his son Ahaziah was king. But we find Jehoshaphat still hasn't learned his lesson. He's still trying to do things with the northern kingdom who God does not have a lot of favor with. He doesn't look favorably upon what they do. It doesn't mean he doesn't love them. It's just they're not living for him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right. So a, uh, uh, this time it wasn't for war, though. This time it was for business. And this brings us to our text. The Bible says Jehoshaphat joined with Ahaziah who acted wickedly. Now, when I, what I want you to notice in this text is that it's not really clear who was acting wickedly. Before we try to figure this out, the word wickedly can also mean lawlessly. All right? So you weren't acting according to the law. You weren't acting according to God's will or God's word. The word wickedly can be translated lawlessly, and if it's translated lawlessly, who was acting lawless? Well, obviously you have two players. It could be King Ahaziah who's acting lawlessly. We know that the Bible says he was. It says, uh, you know, we've already read scripture that proved that point. But it could also be Jehoshaphat. How is Jehoshaphat acting lawlessly? Well, he actually went into an agreement with Ahaziah, and that would be counter to God's will. When you're acting outside of God's will, you're acting, actually acting lawlessly without restraint. The more I study this text, the more I read it, I favor the second viewpoint. Now listen, I'm not saying you can't have a difference of opinion. The commentators are actually divided on this, but I tend to favor the second viewpoint. It was Jehoshaphat who was acting lawlessly in joining with Ahaziah. Even though overall in his reign, the Bible says he was a righteous king, he did act lawlessly in joining with someone who was lawless. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay, In Proverbs 29, 18, it says, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Now, why would I bring this into play? Because what it's saying is that if you keep restraint, right? If you keep restraint, then you're following uh, prophetic vision. And then it says, but blessed is he who keeps the law. So what does that mean? The law is actually something that provides a restraint upon God's people. Now, let me see if I can prove this to you without using the book of Moses or any of the Old Testament. Let me see if I can prove it to you with just modern day life. If there was no speed limit, how many of you would cast off all restraint? Yeah. Right? Why is it that we do not cast off all restraint? Because we fear the lights. Woo, woo, woo. I was watching this, uh, this show on, uh, called Alaska State Troopers, and, and there was this car, and the lights were following them for about five or six miles, and they never pulled over. They weren't, uh, they weren't speeding. They weren't doing anything wrong. The right side of their uh, taillight was out, and so the cop was going to pull them over. But for five miles, the people never pulled over. And so they got all the other cops. They, they did a roadblock. They pulled them over. Well, it turns out they weren't from this country. They were from Taiwan, and they didn't know that they were supposed to pull over. Right? Right. So we, however, know when those lights are behind us, uh-oh, I must have cast off restraint somewhere. I must have done something wrong, right? So the law actually gives you restraint. It provides restraint for God's people. So what I'm trying to get at is that restraint is not always a bad thing. In fact, God considers it a good thing. In Psalms 1, 1 through 3, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. His leaf does not wither, and all he does he prospers. That word blessed can also mean happy. 
depending on the translator and how they decide to translate it. Blessed is the man, happy is the man who meditates upon God's law day and night. What does it mean he meditates upon the law? Well, he doesn't just uh, uh, read it, but he actually meditates on it. He focuses on it, and he lives his life in conformity to God's will. James actually says, be not ye just a hearer of the law, deceiving yourselves, but be ye a doer of the law, right? What I want you to understand is that blessedness comes when we live in harmony and in agreement, or happiness comes when we live in harmony and in agreement with God's will, and God's will is found in His, in His Word. And if you're living in conformity with God's Word, you're going to find that you're going to have restraint placed upon your life. Restraint is not a bad word. Listen, as a person in authority, and I have authority because I'm a father, but I also have authority because I'm a pastor, I have a th some authority in life. Now, I'm not saying I misuse that authority or abuse that authority, but I do have authority. Can we all agree on that? Right? And some of you are going, oh, I didn't give you any authority. Well, anyway, I do. Okay. So, as a person in authority, I have been called over the years, you know, to have to bring some correction or restraint in people's lives. And sometimes those people that I'm correcting or bringing restraint on, the way they react is they say, you're mean. You're a bad man. I mean, I'm seriously, you know, that's, that's what I've been called, you know. Why? Because I don't let them do whatever they want. Listen, if I was to go back here in the morning and uh, some of those kids are getting busy on them donuts, and I said, you can only have one. There's going to be one kid there that's going to say, you're evil. <laughs> Why? Because they can have whatever they want. And what I'm actually doing is that I, I am bringing restraint into their lives. But I want you to know that even in the world, we understand that the lifestyle of someone who is successful in any avenue of life involves restraint. If we look at some of the professional athletes, athletes practice restraint in many different ways. They, re they practice restraint in their diet. I have a nephew that's trying to, to build muscle, and, and he actually uh, practices restraint in his diet. He fixes his meals uh, sometimes a week in advance, and he'll have chicken and chicken and chicken and chicken. Every once in a while, he'll put something, uh, another piece of chicken in there. And then they'll put, like, stuff that many of us find revolting, like Brussels sprouts and broccoli. And some of you love, but some of us don't. We won't speak about who doesn't. But anyway, and he, he, what, what he's doing, though, is he's practicing restraint. Why is he practicing restraint? How is he practicing restraint? He's not eating lasagna every day. He's not enjoying bunt cakes every evening. He's not having ice cream for breakfast. He's not eating honey buns every time he's hungry. You understand what I'm saying? He's practicing restraint in his diet, but he's also practicing restraint in the way he lives his life. He knows that if he wants to be a good athlete, he's going to have to practice several hours a day. So we understand that athletes practice restraint in order to succeed in life. We also understand that if you want to be a college graduate, and we understand that everybody has to become a college graduate. You don't have to go to college to be successful. There are many vocations. Some of us weren't geared to go to college, but we're geared to be vocational. And I want you to know, I actually want to bring that into our church and that understanding into our church. You can actually be someone that's trained vocationally, learning how to be a mechanic or learning how to work in construction, and you can actually far out-earn someone that went to college and got a degree. And there's an absolute need in our society. There are not enough people that work with their hands in society. And not only that, if you can learn how to work with your hands but somehow start a business, you can be extremely successful. Right? However, going back to college graduation, it's also not a bad thing to have a degree. Having a degree can actually set you up for success in life. It can. But in order to get a college degree, you've got to practice restraint. You've got to practice restraint in your studies. You've got to be able to set aside time on a regular basis so that you can study. If you don't do that, you're not going to pass. 
But you also have to practice restraint in your life in the directions that you choose in life. Because if you want to be successful in one area, you can't practice uh, in 25 other areas. If you go to college and you want to get a bachelor's degree in business, you cannot go and take uh, PE, you know, 17 hours of PE and 45 hours of art uh, appreciation and all these kind of things and expect that you're going to graduate in a few years. You've got to say no to some good things so that you can be successful in one thing. Am I making sense to you? Businessmen also have to practice restraint. They have to res practice restraint in their ventures. If you're going to be a, again, if you're going to have a business and that business is saying, like, you know, my daughter just started working for some hair, hair salon, uh, not a hair salon, but a hair supply place. We're not going to promote it here in, in school, but I'll tell you who it is afterwards. Anyway, she started working there. Well, they, they sell beauty supplies. Well, you can't sell beauty supplies and auto parts and, you know, uh, Chinese food and expect to be successful. you got to focus on one thing, right? So you have to practice restraint. Now, that's not saying you can't open another business somewhere down the road, but you can't do it all at once in one place. Most of these places that, that open up and they try to have four or five different types of meals to provide for you usually don't do a good job in any one of them. Right? So you also have to practice restraint in your capital. You can't just go buy anything you want, anytime you want. You have to say, well, how much profit am I making? I should be able to, to take a little bit of that profit and restock. In other words, so I can't pay myself a big paycheck this week because if I do, I won't have enough money to buy any uh, more resources so that I can sell. Right? I remember my uncle in, in Bolivia was telling me that one time he, his kids and his family were struggling. He's divorced, but they were struggling, and so he wanted to be able to set them up so they could be successful. And so what he did is he started a business for them. They opened up a little pizza business in their home, and over there people do that quite a bit. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, what happened was at the end of the month, they would divvy out their profits, and they would never leave enough to be able to buy resources so that they could be in business for the next month. Well, you can only do that two or three months, and then the business is going to fold. I'm making sense. So you have to practice restraint. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Everywhere in this world, we understand. We don't just understand because it's a biblical principle. It is a principle. In order to be successful, you have to practice restraint. Christians, or I should say blessed and happy Christians, will also show restraint, and that restraint is what leads to blessedness. Proverbs 14 and 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Right? What did God say? God said you can eat from every tree in the garden, but you can't eat from this tree. The day that you eat from this tree is the day that you shall surely die. Well, of course, there was a tempter that came in and he tempted Eve, but the bottom line is they failed to practice restraint, and because they failed to practice restraint, not only did they pay the price, but we're paying the price. Am I making sense to you? Right? This is the life of one without restraints. Matthew 16, 24. When we look at Jesus, Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. Now, I don't know how you read that, but when I read it, what I read is the word restraint. You can't do whatever you want. You've got to deny your wants, and you've got to follow after me. Let me lead you in life. And that's the very thing that most of us struggle with. We struggle with letting God lead us in life. We're not going to go there because I preach on this quite a bit. But I just want you to understand. But I also want you to understand that what Jesus called us to do, he practiced. Right? In John 5, 19 and 12, 49, he says, I say what I hear my father saying, and I do what I see my father doing. But the culmination of that is actually found in Luke twenty two forty two, 42, where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows why he came to earth. He knows what he's supposed to do, but he's having a struggle because now all the weight of the world was potentially upon his shoulders. We're not talking about metaphorically. We're talking about literally. And he knows what awaits him. What awaits him is not accolades and, and all these things. What awaits him is a cross and being whipped and being crucified and being, you know, uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 beaten. And all these things are awaiting him. And the anguish of that is awaiting upon him. But when he's praying about it, he said, God, my father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Your will be done. What is he doing? He's practicing restraint. 
The Apostle Paul goes on and talks about Jesus' lifestyle in Philippians 2, 5 and 8. He says to us, have this mind in yourselves. He's talking to you and I. He's writing to the Philippian church, but he's talking to the whole church. And in the Philippians, we find ourselves. And he's saying to us, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let me see if I can uh, give you a graphic representation of what's happening. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is God, 100% God, and nothing in this world is above him. He is God except for the Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are together. And, and, and they, they, they powwowed among themselves before the foundation of the world was laid. They knew what was going to happen. And Jesus said, I will leave what I have here and humble myself and become obedient. And I will become a man and I'll become obedient to God. And I will humble myself. I will restrain myself from my deity. Everything he did on this earth, he did not do as God. He did like you and I as a man. So he restrained himself from using his godhood. And the Bible says he humbled himself. That word humble means he restrained himself. And he became obedient even to the point of going to a cross. Am I making sense to you? Right? But I want you to know that Paul says, have this mind in you that was found in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on and says in Galatians 4, 19 and B, I labor that Christ would be formed in you. What does Christ look like? He looks like a man who wasn't looking out for his own interests, but looking out for the interests of the Father. What I'm trying to tell you is he was living a lifestyle of restraint. Can, I, can you say the word restraint with me? How do we learn to live that life of restraint? How do we do it as Christians if that's what God desires for you and I? In Romans 12, 1 and 2, there's just two scriptures of many, but I'll just use this one. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual form of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So what I'm trying to say and what I believe these scriptures teach us is that in order to find ourselves in that place where we're practicing a life of restraint, we're to bring our bodies under subjection and we're to bring our minds under subjection. How many of y'all are saved here? Only half of the congregation. We're going to give a good altar call after we're done. If you're saved... When you got saved, you are a tripartite being. You are a spirit, soul, and body. When you got saved, you got a new, you, you became a new creation. And the way that happened is your spirit was renewed. Your spirit was, uh, in some sense, rebirthed, recreated. You know, that's what God did for you. And now God's spirit and your spirit are one, and God lives inside of you. However, he did not do anything with your minds, and he did not do anything with your bodies. He's given you favor, and he's given you grace, but he requires us to do something with our bodies and us to do something with our minds. Romans 12, 2 says, you bring, uh, bring your minds into conformity with God's will. How do you do that? I've got to learn God's word. And learning God's word, I've got to practice God's word, right? But not only that, I've got to bring my body into subjection into God's will as well. That means that when my flesh tells me one thing, the word of God tells me something else, I've got to tell my flesh no. And your flesh will tell you stuff, right? Hello, I'm a Christian too. I'm not talking to you from the standpoint of Jesus' stand. I'm talking to you like a man who's walking the same journey that you're walking. I know what it's like to battle the flesh. I know what it's like to be tempted. I know what it's like to have things placed before you and stumbling blocks. If you're not careful, I know exactly what that's like, right? But we're still called to bring our bodies and our minds under subjection. But that's not something God does. That's something that we do. And you're not going to know how to bring restraint into your life if you don't know what the restraints are. 
That's why we're supposed to meditate upon the Word of God. We're supposed to learn the Word of God. And I want to tell you something. More than any other generation in history, we have access to the Word of God more than anybody else ever had. As I've told you before, I've done some study on how we came to have the Bible and the Reformation and things that are happening. And what you've got to realize is that for the longest time, the Word of God was present in a form that most people did not understand. It was written in Latin, right? And actually, the priesthood, the, the religious um, institutions of the thought, time thought it was dangerous to let people read the Word of God in their own language because they didn't have the capacity to be able to interpret it correctly. That was their thinking. It wasn't godly thinking, but that was their thinking. In reality, it was a way to have control, right? And the price that people paid for us to have the Word of God in our own language, literally, people were burned at the stake so that they could get the Word of God out to the people. Finally, when the Word of God started getting out to the people, many, many lives were lost. Many people paid a tremendous price so that we could have the Scriptures in our own language. And it actually transformed much of Europe. It transformed the United States of America. It transformed. We would not be here if it wasn't for the Word of God. The, the constitution that we wrote would not be in place if it wasn't for the Word of God and the truths that are contained in the Word of God. And, and yet, I, with all that in mind, I would be willing to somehow propose that many of us, we don't value it the way we should. We don't read it the way we should. And you say, well, I'm not a reader. Well, with our technology today, we even have a way for these little women that live in your phone. And one of them is called Cortana, and one of them is called Siri. I don't know how they get them in there. But somehow or another, they can actually read the Bible to you. And yet with all this, with all the price that was paid, with all this, I believe, unfortunately and sadly, that many of us as Christians, and yes, I'm talking to our church, many of us as Christians fail to recognize the treasure that's contained within this word. So what does this have to do with our text? My point is Jehoshaphat, a righteous king, is the one, I believe, who was acting lawlessly or without restraint. Why? He is getting involved with one who is lawless. And because he gets involved with someone who is lawless, it ends up wrecking his business venture. Now, I want you to know that as Christians, we can be overall righteous people because in Christ we've been made righteous by the blood of the Lamb. We give him our cloak of sinfulness, and he gives us his cloak of righteousness. We're not made righteous because of anything we've done. We're made righteous by what? because of what Jesus has done. But the Bible does say in Ephesians 4.1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. What have we been called? Righteous. So we've got to learn how to walk what we have been called. We've got to learn how to walk righteously right? Jehoshaphat is a righteous king, but you know what? He got involved in an unrighteous venture. Overall, as Christians, we're called righteous, but there are often, I believe, areas in our lives where we don't live righteously. Areas in our lives. It's kind of like if I go to your home, some of y'all going, please don't do that. (laughs) If I go to your home and I give you enough notice you will go and you will clean up the areas of your home that you think I'm going to be in. However, what you may not know is that I know you're putting a lot of this stuff in another area. Right? You say, well, clean up. What does it mean to clean up? Throw it in the bedroom. Why? He's not going in there. Right? Throw it in the closet. See, you, you want me to go to those places that are clean, but you don't want me to go see those places, the closets and the attics and, and the back places. Well, we have areas like that in our lives. We have areas like that where we let the light shine and, and we see the mess and we let God come in and clean us, but there are some areas where we will not let God in or we don't want God to go in, right? Right? We have not and are often unwilling to bring those areas of our life under restraint. 
under subjection to God's word and God's will. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Notice it doesn't say, in most of your ways. It doesn't say, in a great majority of your ways. It says, in all your ways. Can I tell you what? The Christian life is this. We no longer are our own. We've been bought with a price. We belong to Him. But we still have free will. But in His mind, when you got saved, you said, God, I can't handle my life. You take my life. And I believe He takes it seriously that you gave Him your life. And so He will seek to work in your life sometimes whether He want it or not. Now you can say no And he'll say no, but I believe he still believes, and he rightfully does, has opportunity and the right to be able to mess with you in your lives. That's why he sends people like me to preach the Word of God. That's why sometimes when you're going through on the Christian channel, you'll everything you hear, every song you hear, every sermon that somebody sends you, everything, it just seems to bring conviction into your life. Now listen, it's not for your detriment, it's for your benefit. A doctor will do everything he can if he finds that there's cancer in your life. He will do everything he can to cut that out. And sometimes when you're going through the treatment, you think, this guy, he doesn't like me. This guy is trying to hurt me. This guy is trying to put me under, but he's actually not trying to kill you. He's trying to get you to a place where you can live. And that's what God wants for your life. But in order sometimes for you to be able to live blessed and happy, he's got to do some cutting. He's got to do some treatment in your life. Now, Now, again, going back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it doesn't say in most of your ways or in most of your heart, but in all your ways, with all your heart. Now, I want to give you some examples. Sometimes we say, well, God, my life is yours, except in matters of the heart. Don't try to tell me who I can date and who I can't date. Don't try to tell me whether I can have sex with somebody before marriage or after marriage. God, I love you. You know I love you. But don't try to mess with this area of my life. Or how about finances? You can have all my life, but don't mess with my finances. I know they haven't come and told me, but sometimes I just know things. I know we've lost people over the years because I've taught that God's desire and will for your life is that you be a giver. And I know that the enemy's right there telling you that preacher just wants my money. He's trying to buy himself some kind of jet or he's trying to do something. I'm not drinking that Kool-Aid. I will follow God. How about maybe in areas of entertainment? Maybe there's some areas in your life when it comes to entertainment that God's trying to get a hold of you, but you just won't give it to Him, whether it be the things that you watch or whether it be the, uh, the video games that you play. You can have anything in my life, God, but not that. How about church attendance? How many people, and of course all you guys are different because you're here, but how many people do we know that says, I love God, I love Him with all my heart, but I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. What you're basically saying is, don't mess with that area of my life. This passage in our text teaches us that God does not overlook these areas that we think we can get away with. We might think He does, but He doesn't. Because he sent a prophet to, uh, with his word in regard to Ahaziah, in regard to Jehoshaphat. You know, when, uh, and he sent a prophet to Jehoshaphat and he said to him, you need to heed my word in this life. He didn't learn his lesson with Ahab and apparently he didn't learn his lesson with Ahaziah as well. Because a prophet is sent to him and tells him because he acted lawlessly, his venture would fail. His venture would come to ruin. Why is God like that? Well, I will tell you that regardless of how you feel about God and why God is like that, I will tell you that God is good. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now listen, it just, I'm just using this because it's summertime. We just got through with spring break. I cannot understand how any parent will let their juveniles or let uh, or fun even sometimes their teenagers to go down to Padre Island when what they're doing during spring break is basically living a Sodom and a Gomorrah lifestyle. 
well, they're my kids. They can do whatever they want. Well, in some sense, you, you may not be able to bring restraint upon their life, but I'm pretty sure you cannot finance it. Am I making sense to you? That may not be for anybody here, but it might be for somebody that watches this podcast a little bit later on. We have an obligation as parents to bring restraint upon our kids. We don't do it because we don't love them. We do it because we love them. I know that if you go over here, there is an opportunity and there is a, uh, there is a good chance that you're going to become something other than what God says you are. You're going to get involved in some kind of uh, uh, drinking or drugs or sexual immorality, and I'm not going to let that happen on my watch. Now, I can't keep you. You can do whatever you want. You, as a kid, you can do whatever you want. But as I said before, I'm going to do everything I can to not let that happen. And if I'm a good father and we're good fathers and mothers, you know, how much more God? He doesn't bring restraint on your life to hurt you. It's to help you. I'm going to make sense to you. God teaches us that there are consequences to going outside of His will. And in some sense, that is the mercy of God. If we didn't experience consequences for doing things that were wrong, we might not change. Those things that are outside of His will, we're going to use that word. Pastor, you said you would never use that word. Never did. We're going to use that word that we don't like to use in church, but we call it sin. And the Bible calls it sin. There are consequences to sin. Sin is living outside of God's law, outside of God's will, not bringing restraint into your life. You say, well, what do you mean sin? The Bible says in James 4, 17, whoever knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. You say, well, don't tell me. Don't tell me. You also have a conscience. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He will let you know that some of the things that you're not doing aren't right. When we fail to bring areas under restraint, we're allowing sin to leaven our lives. You know what leaven is? For some of you guys that have done some baking in the past, we we call it yeast. But I think leaven was actually, they would take some of the dough that already had yeast in it, and they would use that as a starter before they had little packets. They would use that as a starter in dough that didn't have yeast in it. They would take, and they would leaven it with another batch of dough that already had yeast in it. And so what would happen is, and you put that yeast in it, that yeast doesn't stop until it infects the whole dough. We use it for good, but sin is also can be like leaven. You let a little bit of sin in your life. It's kind of like saying we tell people that, are, that, that have unforgiveness in your life. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You can't allow sin in your life and, not ex- and expect it to stay in one place. Sin actually has a life of its own, and there are consequences to sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is Death, another word for death is destruction. And what was it that was bringing or coming into Jehoshaphat's venture? God said, because you've got outside of my will and my restraint, it's going to bring destruction into this area of your life. When we allow sin to have its course in our life, it wreaks havoc. It brings destruction. Now, I want you to notice that in our text, it doesn't say that the prophet said God will destroy you. It doesn't say that. We tend to read it that way, but that's not what it says. But it does just say that he will destroy what you have made. Now, this is important. That word you, when he says he will destroy what you have made, is not, he's not just talking to Jehoshaphat. It's plural. So he's saying, I will destroy what you and Ahaziah have birthed together. You is plural. And I lose some of you already. I hope I haven't. I will destroy what you and Ahaziah has birthed together. Why does God do that? Why does that happen? Because you can't join together the holy and the sinful. You can't join together the sacred and the profane. They don't work together. They don't mingle together. It will not work. How often do we give birth to things outside of God's will and somehow reason that it will be blessed in the end? God is merciful and full of grace. But more often than not, we end up experiencing loss when we refuse to restrain ourselves to God's word on the matter. 
It's not God's will to be in the situation, but when we persist against His will and find ourselves there, why are we surprised and even angry with God when that thing begins to unravel in our lives? Jehoshaphat was taught this lesson with the records of his business venture. I wonder how many of us have not learned that lesson yet. I see it over and over again. I, and this is a matter in matters of the heart. You know, Christians start going out with non-Christians. Believers get involved with non-believers. And our hope is that if we just get involved in their life somewhere down the road, you know, they're going to become a Christian. But over and over again, I see it more often than not. It does not happen. And later on down the road, the marriage becomes a disaster. Why? Because they don't have the same values. They don't have the same desires. They can only be intimate up to a point. Because one is absolutely in love with Jesus and the other one wants nothing to do with him. Now, I'm not saying that God isn't merciful. He is. And sometimes God, in spite of ourselves, does something significant to change the situation. But the reality is, you can't bank on God's mercy. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying that God won't forgive you, but you can't bank on God's mercy to get you out of the situation that you're in because the situation that you're in was a cause by your unwillingness to heed and restrain yourselves from what God wanted you to do in life. In other words, God said no, and you said yes. God will forgive you of your sin, but he doesn't always get you out of the consequences. You might say, I don't like that. The reality is, even with, if it's okay with Pilar, uh, it's okay if I use Oscar. Oscar was my friend, and I miss him dearly. I love that man, except for the Cowboys. I don't know why he liked the Cowboys, but live 20 years of his life for God. Is that correct? But the, all the years that he lived prior to that, he lived as an alcoholic. Just absolutely, totally committed to alcohol. And God saved him when he called out to God. And God did a work in his life. And he had quite a few years with God. But eventually, even as a Christian, the consequences of living that lifestyle ended up taking his life. He died of liver liver disease, correct? Ended up taking his life. So what I'm trying to tell you is that God was merciful. He really was. Now, God can heal your liver, and we're believing that he'll heal everybody's liver. But the reality is sometimes there are some situations that he just doesn't get you out of. Right? So, well, Pastor, this is not a very hopeful message. I don't I don't see this as very uplifting. I'm not trying to be hopeful and uplifting. I'm trying to be truthful with you. And the truth is that if you'll stop some of those things now, you may not have to pay a price later down the road. John Maxwell says it this way, everybody pays. You either pay now and you can play later, or if you play now, you're going to pay later, but everybody pays. Right? If you go through the struggle and the hurts right now of saying no to something that's not God's will in your life, it may hurt you somewhere in the present, but somewhere down the road you're going to find yourself growing into that tree that is, you know, like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Its leaves shall not wither, and whatever we do shall prosper. But if you don't cut that off in the beginning, you may find that you may have a few good seasons, but somewhere down the road disease begins to infect the tree, and then all of a sudden it doesn't grow into what it should be. It grows deformed. It doesn't grow quite full the way God wants it to grow. Now, there are many of us here that can stand up and say, listen to what he's saying because he's telling you the truth. Because I'm paying a price for some of the things that I've done later in life. I mean, earlier in life. And if I could go back, I would change it. So, you know, there's not much that we can do. God is still merciful and graceful, and we pray that God will do things in their life. But if they could stand up, I'm sure there are many here that would stand up and say, listen to what pastor is telling you. Don't go down this road because it will hurt somewhere down the road. You will experience much pain if you don't heed God. Learn how to yield and submit and resist yourself and bring your life into submission into the things of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Right? 
Practice restraint in your life. Why? So that you can grow up and become that tree planted by the rivers of water that shall bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatever we do shall prosper. I feel like there's a message in tongues or there's a prophetic word. Does anybody feel like they have one of those? Because I, I just feel like there is something. Just hold for a moment. Don't try to tell me who I can date and who I can't date. Don't try to tell me whether I can have sex with somebody before marriage or after marriage. God, I love you. You know I love you. But don't try to mess with this area of my life. Or how about finances? You can have all my life, but don't mess with my finances. I know they haven't come and told me, but sometimes I just know things. I know we've lost people over the years because I've taught that God's desire and will for your life is that you be a giver. And I know that the enemy's right there telling you that preacher just wants my money. He's trying to buy himself some kind of jet or he's trying to do something. I'm not drinking that Kool-Aid. I will follow God. How about maybe in areas of entertainment? Maybe there's some areas in your life when it comes to entertainment that God's trying to get a hold of you, but you just won't give it to Him, whether it be the things that you watch or whether it be the, uh, the video games that you play. You can have anything in my life, God, but not that. How about church attendance? How many people, and of course all you guys are different because you're here, but how many people do we know that says, I love God, I love Him with all my heart, but I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. What you're basically saying is, don't mess with that area of my life. The, this passage in our text teaches us that God does not overlook these areas that we think we can get away with. He, we might think He does, but He doesn't because He sent a prophet to, uh, with His word in regard to Ahaziah and regard to Jehoshaphat. You know, when, uh, and He sent a prophet to Jehoshaphat and He said to him, you need to heed my word in this life. He didn't learn his lesson with Ahab and apparently he didn't learn his lesson with Ahaziah as well. Because a prophet is sent to him and tells him because he acted lawlessly, his venture would fail. His venture would come to ruin. Why is God like that? Well, I will tell you that regardless of how you feel about God and why God is like that, I will tell you that God is good. Jeremiah 29 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now listen, it just, I'm just using this because it's summertime. We just got through with spring break. I cannot understand how any parent will let their juveniles or let uh, or fun even sometimes their teenagers to go down to Padre Island when what they're doing during spring break is basically living a Sodom and a Gomorrah lifestyle. Well, they're my kids. They can do whatever they want. Well, in some sense, you, you may not be able to bring restraint upon their life, but I'm pretty sure you cannot finance it. Am I making sense to you? That may not be for anybody here, but it might be for somebody that watches this podcast a little bit later on. We have an obligation as parents to bring restraint upon our kids. We don't do it because we don't love them. We do it because we love them. I know that if you go over here, there is an opportunity and there is, uh, uh, there is a good chance that you're going to become something other than what God says you are. You're going to get involved in some kind of uh, uh, drinking or drugs or sexual immorality, and I'm not going to let that happen on my watch. Now, I can't keep you. You can do whatever you want. You, as a kid, you can do whatever you want. But as I said before, I'm going to do everything I can to not let that happen. And if I'm a good father and we're good fathers and mothers, you know, how much more God? He doesn't bring restraint on your life to hurt you. It's to help you. I'm going to make sense to you. God teaches us that there are consequences to going outside of His will. And in some sense, that is the mercy of God. If we didn't experience consequences for doing things that were wrong, we might not change. Those things that are outside of His will, we're going to use that word. Pastor, you said you would never use that word. Never did. We're going to use that word that we don't like to use in church, but we call it sin. And the Bible calls it sin. There are consequences to sin. 
Sin is living outside of God's law, outside of God's will, not bringing restraint into your life. You say, well, what do you mean sin? The Bible says in James 4, 17, whoever knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. You say, well, don't tell me. Don't tell me. You also have a conscience. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He will let you know that some of the things that you're not doing aren't right. When we fail to bring areas under restraint, we're allowing sin to leaven our lives. You know what leaven is? For some of you guys that have done some baking in the past, we, we call it yeast. But I think leaven was actually, they would take some of the dough that already had yeast in it, and they would use that as a starter before they had little packets. They would use that as a starter in dough that didn't have yeast in it. They would take, and they would leaven it with another batch of dough that already had yeast in it. And so what would happen is, and you put that yeast in it, that yeast doesn't stop until it infects the whole dough. We use it for good, but sin is also can be like leaven. You let a little bit of sin in your life. It's kind of like saying we tell people that, are, that, that have unforgiveness in your life. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You can't allow sin in your life and, not ex- and expect it to stay in one place. Sin actually has a life of its own, and there are consequences to sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is Death, another word for death is destruction. And what was it that was bringing or coming into Jehoshaphat's venture? God said, because you've got outside of my will and my restraint, it's going to bring destruction into this area of your life. When we allow sin to have its course in our life, it wreaks havoc. It brings destruction. Now, I want you to notice that in our text, it doesn't say that the prophet said, God will destroy you. It doesn't say that. We tend to read it that way, but that's not what it says. But it does just say that he will destroy what you have made. Now, this is important. That word you, when he says he will destroy what you have made, is not, he's not just talking to Jehoshaphat. It's plural. So he's saying, I will destroy what you and Ahaziah have birthed together. You is plural. And I lose some of you already. I hope I haven't. I will destroy what you and Ahaziah has birthed together. Why does God do that? Why does that happen? Because you can't join together the holy and the sinful. You can't join together the sacred and the profane. They don't work together. They don't mingle together. It will not work. How often do we give birth to things outside of God's will and somehow reason that it will be blessed in the end? God is merciful and full of grace. But more often than not, we end up experiencing loss when we refuse to restrain ourselves to God's word on the matter. It's not God's will to be in the situation, but when we persist against His will and find ourselves there, why are we surprised and even angry with God when that thing begins to unravel in our lives? Jehoshaphat was taught this lesson with the records of his business venture. I wonder how many of us have not learned that lesson yet. I see it over and over again, I, and this is a matter in matters of the heart. You know, Christians start going out with non-Christians. Believers get involved with non-believers, and our hope is that if we just get involved in their life somewhere down the road, you know, they're going to get they're going to become a Christian. But over and over again, I see it more often than not. It does not happen, and later on down the road, the marriage becomes a disaster. Why? Because they don't have the same values. They don't have the same desires. They can only be intimate up to a point. Because one is absolutely in love with Jesus and the other one wants nothing to do with him. Now, I'm not saying that God isn't merciful. He is. And sometimes God, in spite of ourselves, does something significant to change the situation. But the reality is, you can't bank on God's mercy. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying that God won't forgive you. But you can't bank on God's mercy to get you out of the situation that you're in. Because the situation that you're in was a cause by your unwillingness to heed and restrain yourselves from what God wanted you to do in life. In other words, God said no, and you said yes. 
God will forgive you of your sin, but He doesn't always get you out of the consequences. You might say, I don't like that. The reality is, even with, if it's okay with Pilar, uh, it's okay if I use Oscar. Oscar was my friend, and I miss him dearly. I love that man, except for the Cowboys. I don't know why he liked the Cowboys. But. <laughs> Lived 20 years of his life for God. Is correct? But the, all the years that he lived prior to that, he lived as an alcoholic. Just absolutely, totally committed to alcohol. And God saved him when he called out to God. And God did a work in his life. And he had quite a few years with God. But eventually, even as a Christian, the consequences of living that lifestyle ended up taking his life. He died of liver, liver disease, correct? Ended up taking his life. So what I'm trying to tell you is that God was merciful. He really was. Now, God can heal your liver, and we're believing that he'll heal everybody's liver. But the reality is sometimes there are some situations that he just doesn't get you out of. Right? So, well, Pastor, this is not a very hopeful message. I don't, I don't see this as very uplifting. I'm not trying to be hopeful and uplifting. I'm trying to be truthful with you. And the truth is that if you'll stop some of those things now, you may not have to pay a price later down the road. John Maxwell says it this way, everybody pays. You either pay now and you can play later, or if you play now, you're going to pay later, but everybody pays. Right? If you go through the struggle and the hurts right now of saying no to something that's not God's will in your life, it may hurt you somewhere in the present, but somewhere down the road you're going to find yourself growing into that tree that is, you know, like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit and its season, its leaves shall not wither and whatever we do shall prosper. But if you don't cut that off in the beginning, you may find that you may have a few good seasons, but somewhere down the road disease begins to infect the tree and then all of a sudden it doesn't grow into what it should be. It grows deformed. It doesn't grow quite full the way God wants it to grow. Now, there are many of us here that can stand up and say, listen to what he's saying because he's telling you the truth. Because I'm paying a price for some of the things that I've done later in life. I mean, earlier in life. And if I could go back, I would change it. So, you know, there's not much that we can do. God is still merciful and graceful, and we pray that God will do things in their life. But if they could stand up, I'm sure there are many here that would stand up and say, listen to what pastor is telling you. Don't go down this road because it will hurt somewhere down the road. You will experience much pain if you don't heed God. Learn how to yield and submit and resist yourself and bring your life into submission into the things of God. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Right? Practice restraint in your life. Why? So that you can grow up and become that tree planted by the rivers of water. That shall bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. I feel like there's a mess taught this lesson with the wreckage of his business venture. My hope, and I believe God's desire, is that we learn from this and bring all, every area of our life, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's really there under his lordship. Psalms 91 says, under the shelter of his wings that we find refuge. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. It is he that will deliver me from the snare of the fowl and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me with his pinions that under his wings I may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. I will not be afraid of the terror by night, of the arrow that strikes by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. I will only look on with my eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no plague shall come near your tent. And I could go on, but see, the point of this is that you hide yourself in God. He is the word. Practice restraint, submission, lordship. Let him be lord of every area of your life. And if you do that, it may hurt a little bit now. But in the future, you will experience 
a great amount of blessedness and happiness in your life.